Hello, everyone. Welcome to our webinar, Digital Taxation, State of the Art and Further Developments. This webinar is hosted by the Digital Cooperation Organization, GCO. I'm Menel Bundi, Digital Taxation Director at GCO, and I will be moderating today's session. I have with me four uh, speakers, four prominent tax experts. Uh, first, our first speaker is Andy Noteliers. Andy is a uh, Transfer Pricing Partner, Belgium and Luxembourg at Tiberian, member of WTS Global, the global leading tax practice. Andy will be outlining the main features of OECD Pillar 1, as well as the UN uh, proposal on Article 12b. Our second speaker is Daniel uh, Bluchley. Daniel is uh, the international tax partner of WTS for Germany, member of WTS Global. Daniel will be outlining uh, the policy rationale and the design of Pillar 2 of the OECD proposal. Uh, our third speaker is uh, Leonard Wagenar. Leonard is the Director of Transaction Tax at EY London, and Leonard will be discussing the political aspects of both deals and future developments. Uh, last but not least, uh, our fourth speaker is Sunny Bilanay. Sunny is Digital Transfer Pricing APAC, ABGA, Finland and India. Uh, Sunny will discuss two subtopics, I would say, uh, implementation challenges related to Globi Rules Pillar 2 of the OECD proposal and the potential impact of the OECD deal on developed and developing countries. Uh, before we start, two uh, technical quick notes. The first one is that this uh, webinar is uh, recorded, so you can uh, have it on demand after the live broadcast. The second one is uh, that um, we have a Q&A session at the end of the live, broad live broadcast, so uh, please feel free to type your questions in, in the chat box. So uh, having said that, uh, let's get started. Uh, Andy, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you, Manel, for the introduction. Um, I assume that everybody can hear me, otherwise uh, I'll see strange faces, but uh, I guess it's okay. Um, oh. So, yes, the presentation. Um, so I'm going to give an introduction, short introduction on, on Pillar 1, um, where it's sensitive. If we go to the next slide, I... Um, if we could go to the second slide, I think... Um, the basic discussion of what it is, uh, why it exists, how it works, and uh, when can we all expect this? I think these are the, the key questions or the key topics we want to uh, have an introduction. So we'll start with the first what uh, section. So um, pillar one is part of the two pillar solution, which is part of the statement of the OECD and uh, the G20 inclusive framework, which was made on 8 October. 8th of October 2021, which is uh, a consensus document um, of what they were intending to do together with uh, the steps to be taken at the OCD and inclusive framework level to bring it live and, and with respect to amount A, which we will see uh, for pillar one with an effective um, implementation as of 2023. We'll see, see how that stands today. But it stems from BEPS action one, um, uh, the date there should be 5 October 20, uh, actually, which was a report of ABAPS Action uh, 1, tax challenges arising from digitalization, where in 2020, um, so it's a wrong slide, um, the uh, conclusion was that uh, this, this digital era should, or this digital business should not be ring-fenced. Nevertheless, in the meantime, I think the pilot, pilot, political debate uh, ramped up um, 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 to 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 actually address it because uh, states have implemented uh, at their own will and, and with their own sovereign power uh, a digital services tax, um, which has led to um, a dispute amongst countries. Mainly, if we look at what France, Germany um, 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 were proposing for digital services tax compared to and, and the companies that were intended to be hit by this digital service tax compared to what uh, is on the other side of the ocean with the US. I think that brought things into uh, development. I think Leonard probably will, will go into uh, more of the political debate, but notwithstanding 
Uh, Bab's conclusion was that digitalization should not have been ring fenced. It it is actually the predecessor of this uh, pillar two pillar uh, solution, of which I will deal with uh, pillar one. Now, in the meantime, of October twenty twenty one and today, there were various pillar one consultations, which which have uh, an impact on on the discussion. Um, mainly geared towards what shall we do with a Mount A. Um, only recently, um, on the 11th of July 2022, um, the OECD issued a progress report on amount A of Pillar 1, which means that this is a um, public consultation ongoing as we speak now, which will be closing in a few weeks um, for this progress report. Now, in between this statement on the two pillar solution of October 21 and this progress report, this is the only item or the only time that there was a certain amount of consensus. We'll go back to that point uh, in the next slide. So if we use this slide of the what into the why, um, then we, 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 we can see that a lot of the things that are being published on why this pillar one solution is, is actually needed. It refers to, uh, well, the, the, the way of doing business in today's and tomorrow's environment, digitalization, etc. And early, early on proposals have dealt with, um, shall we actually limit it to digital companies um, um, or consumer facing business? If you look what in the end now the definition of the scope of pillar two or sorry of pillar one is then we would see that um well it it concerns the biggest multinationals in terms of amount a um which deals with the the reallocation of taxing rights but it it has left the stance of automated digital services uh being um, um targeted because that would have been like a too narrow um, um, source of application, I think, for, for the US um, to deal with. And, and therefore, actually, the reason for Pillar 1 solution is the digitalization, um, but it's more of a political um, um, debate and um, status quo of, of, of who should be targeted or not. So if you look at the scope of, of amount A, um, all multinationals in excess with a turnover in excess of 20 billion. After seven years, it will go down to to to, to seven billion, um, and with a profitability, a profit before tax in in excess of 10 percent. Um, that's only I think it was 108 companies worldwide who are initially hit, um, and it's also excluding extractive companies and, and regulated financial services. So there's only 108 hit, and I think. Probably this is set in this manner um, um, because of the political balance they want to have uh, that not only uh, the Googles and, and the Amazons and Facebooks, uh, which was that GAFA uh, thing, um, are, are targeted, but that there would be a certain political balance. Now, the scope of amount B, I will come back to what that is again, um, is for all M&E uh, with a targeted transaction uh, of baseline marketing and distribution. Now, why? So if we if we if we are not dealing with digitalization um, only anymore, yeah, it, it also also of course has to do with with getting more revenues. Now back in the time of, of October twenty one, USD one hundred twenty five billion was targeted uh, to be uh, collected. Today this number is, is still maintained. Uh, what has happened in between is this, like I said, this pillar one consultations mainly on subparts of amount A, from which uh, actually um, the most of the commentators being in favor or in disfavor of uh, amount A both said like, yeah, but if we if we need to give our technical advice on, on little parts of this amount A without knowing all of the other components um, that uh, actually built up the amount A, yeah, we cannot give a substantive overall uh, uh, commentary. And now, today, we are at that point in time, right? So with this progress report, which actually bundles all of this previous sub um, um, parts of amount A discussions, um, we are at that stage. Now, this bundling um, of this item is one, also not all 
also not um, fully complete. It does include already previously uh, previous commentary, um, but it also includes old uh, stuff. Um, still work to do, and it's still non-consensus. So the only thing what is in consensus here is the cover note, which has been published on 11 June of July, which uh, includes a framework set like, okay, this is the, the new timeline, and this is the new work, the path uh, that we want to proceed on and, and work on uh, going forward. So actually, pillar one is happening as we speak now. Again, I think it's a bit of a, a revamping of the project. Um, maybe my colleagues have, have, have other views uh, uh, later on in this call. Um, what we understand from the rumors at, in Paris is that people of the Pillar 2 project uh, of the OECD have been um, switched over to the Pillar 1 group to, to step up the process at the OECD level because they were a bit lagging behind. If we go to the next slide or, um, uh, or, or the one after that. Yeah. Um, well, the, the 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 progress report gives a new timeline as well. Um, so I think that at the OECD level, they want to want to actually ramp up the pillar one work. So if we can go one back, uh, um, Manel, um, how how are you going to do this? Uh, so the the three key areas of pillar one is an amount A, an amount B, and tax certainty, right? Um, an amount A. It's not a very exotic name, but it's about the reallocation of taxing, taxing rights. And what they want to do is to determine residual profits, and 25% of that we're going to assign to market jurisdictions, which is very, very new con concept um, because it is not, not on the basis of a nexus as we knew it. Um, it's not about physical presence whether through a legal entity or a PE, but it's to market jurisdictions. So this means that there's a lot of um, technical issues and complexity in determining uh, this profit allocation going through the revenue sourcing of this, this market jurisdiction. The re reallocation of taxation rights means that you will have winners and you will have losers. So there's, in contrast to pillar two, where a new tax uh, is created, top-up tax, um, here it is about redistributing the taxation rights on part of the profit, right? So um, that's why this one is intended to be implemented by a multilateral convention uh, amongst all these jurisdictions. Um, amount B, so amount A scope is very limited uh, uh, as we speak. Amount B is broader. And it's presented as a simplification of the arm's length principle for baseline marketing and distribution of returns. Uh, you might, well, it, it holds in between, like uh, some people say it's a safe harbor for, for transfer pricing, uh, benchmarking of, of, of regular uh, sales and marketing uh, functions. Uh, I'm not fully in agreement with that because, yeah, how are they going to um, exactly determine what is then this, this scope of functionality versus an arm's length principle view? Um, but in any case, it, it, for me, it's, it's, it is the next step of the OECD actually undermining its own arm's length principle um, of making shortcuts. And they do that um, also in the regular OECD transfer pricing guidelines, they said like, and some of these shortcuts are good for multinationals, so don't, don't understand me wrong. So they have these low value adding services, cost plus five, you don't have to worry about that much anymore in many countries, but you also have negative ones. Like for the financial transactions section, which was new in the OECD guidelines, um, the group perspective and the presumption that the treasury center is a cost plus type of thing, those are all shortcuts um, that may, under, may or may not undermine a bit of the arm's length principle. So this is like amount B, which is like also the stepmother of, of, of the work of, of, under the OCD now, because there's, there's not much uh, done yet uh, in, in terms of this amount B. Uh, every focus was on amount A. Uh, amount B will be on the agenda for, I think, for the, the, the second part of the year as well. They reconfirmed that in that cover note um, um, this time. So that will be on. More importantly, is of course, if we have winners and losers in amount A, you're going to have a dispute, uh, prevention needed uh, amongst jurisdictions uh, for amount A. Um, well, they have worked already on that. Uh, it's a complex complex item, as we will see in the next slide. 
Um, but that's not the end of it. But what actually is the political consensus of this, of swallowing this uh, pillar one or amount A, is about the removal of digital service taxes. Uh, that's that's also in a multilateral convention. Like, if you sign up for this and we want to have this, we want to be part of this pillar one um, uh, project, I'm going to actually refrain from implementing any this digital service taxes. That's the end game, I think, uh, of what they want to want to achieve. So if we look at then the how of what is the latest 11 July progress report, so there's, there's a lot of work, well, there's work still to be done, um, but a lot of attention was given to amount A. So the also new segmentation rules is something to be looked at if you only were up to speed for uh, uh, pillar one up to June or something, new things to look at is new segmentation rules. It is not that um, if, a, if, if, if a segment has uh, 10 billion of uh, 20 billion of revenue and a profitability of 10%, but the multinational as a whole doesn't have this profitability, also on that segment level, you can fall under scope of this thing, which is way, way, way for, for real big companies. Um, transition rules to have this revenue sourcing, very important. Um, I think what is what is what is very 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 um, uh, important is to understand that this elimination of double taxation goes through some kind of a waterfall. So will, you will have a lot of jurisdictions involved, and you will need to bundle them in different tiers and tier one until tier one uh, three B, which means that like if you run into double taxation, it's gonna be like hell to get this this eliminated, but it's going to be a follow a waterfall uh, and a lot of steps um, to do that. Now, if I then may uh, round up uh, my topic um, on the planning for pillar one. So we're now in this reviewing and discussing this progress report. There will be an October meeting on which also other building blocks will need to be discussed. So October 2020 will be very defining uh, for it. The work among amount B which is currently like very, very open, will be also need to be done by the end of 2020. So they want to have also the multilateral convention ready half of 23 and to have amount A at least in, uh, to be put in force in 2024. Now there is some skeptical uh, uh, skepticism on, on whether they will be reachable, reaching that date, even uh, certainly because of the, the, the avoidance of double taxation, if that would not be uh, done. Then, then it would be uh, hard to do. Now, if we, to conclude, compare this to the UN work on Article 12B, this is the new provision for taxing income of automated digital services. Then you see that this is more geared towards solving the issue which Pillar 1 said is actually historically solving. So it is about automated digital services. So there will be a nexus also, which is new because um, you cannot you cannot do that uh, without um, having a new nexus, but which would be based on the location of the payer of the automated digital services. And you could you, well um, currently there's still or well, there's the option to select uh, um, getting to it as a withholding tax or on the basis of of a net annual income uh, of of the foreign entities like this virtual PE type of stuff, which was on the table uh, um, on at the OECD level also way back. Now, this is a different solution um, as pillar one because it, it requires a less big modification of exist, existing international um, tax system um, because you can implement Article 12B in, a, in, a, in, a, in, in your bilateral uh, tax treaty, uh, whereas in pillar one, you need to have like a significant portion of the world agreeing uh, to this multilateral uh, uh, convention, which uh, they say themselves, it should not be everyone in the world, but a significant portion. But that means that you really have a real significant portion, US, uh, Germany, France, uh, stuff like that. Um, for It is said to be more beneficial for um, developing countries, this Article 12b, than uh, what will uh, this uh, Pillar 1 bring uh, for them. Um, and it doesn't restrict your uh, uh, sovereign taxing rights. So it resembles a digital service tax, but it also has a formulary, formulary uh, profit allocation because of this election um, um, type of stuff. Um, but I don't think it will it will make the cut uh, in the end because of the political 
uh, the political power of the others wanting to strain away from this digital service tax. This is too much closely related to digital service tax, although it is easier, although it is more focused and targeted, although it is uh, probably more beneficial for the ones who, who really need it the most. Um, I, I guess Leonard will go into the politics more. Um, I guess this will not be uh, making the cut compared to uh, the pillar one, but also on that front, yeah, if pillar one, if any time in time, it will be implemented. It's just a question mark. I think a lot of things will happen now in, in 22 from a technical side to keep an eye on. It's, it's only starting now, actually. Thanks. So uh, thank you very much, Andy. It was was actually uh, very in, uh, insightful and very comprehensive. Um, Daniel, uh, what can you tell us about Pillar 2? Yeah, hello, everybody. Um, let's talk about Pillar 2. Uh, please go to slide 2 of my presentation, which is uh, Pillar 2 is much more concrete than Pillar 1. And therefore, I would uh, like to introduce you in the way it works. And uh, page two, please. And uh, here we have a, a very good oversight of what is going on with Pillar 2. Um, the m and &E groups which are targeted by Pillar 2 are 750 million uh, sales. And uh, if a, a group is uh, uh, subject to Pillar 2, it has to file a tax return uh, in the headquarter country in general. Pillar 2 has uh, uh, two, let me say, ways of uh, Levi taxes. The first one is the income inclusion rule. We are mainly talking uh, about this rule here in the next minutes. And the second one is the under tax payment rule. The first one is uh, 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 the obligation for a headquarter to file a tax return uh, uh, for the whole group, where the uh, uh, um, objective is to grant a 15% minimum tax rate per country of each uh, uh, country which is part of the group. And uh, the ultimate, the, the, the under tax payment rule is uh, uh, for, for inbound uh, uh, yeah, investments into countries which uh, uh, um, introduced the under tax payment rules and uh, where the headquarter did uh, not introduce the IIR. And uh, uh, the, the income for the under tax payment rule is allocated uh, through or, or to the countries which are participating in the under tax payment rules. So let, let's talk about uh, uh, the income inclusion rule and how it, it works in, in detail. As mentioned, um, the objective of this rule uh, um, is a multinational enterprise uh, uh, group, which, so, sorry, what that go back please to yeah here we, we are right still and uh, uh, the, the the first step is you need to identify uh, which uh, constituent entities are part of this group uh, uh, which companies are obliged to file tax returns the ultimate parent entity is obliged to file tax returns um, and uh, uh, to calculate the, the, the top up tax Additional companies uh, um, or constituent entities which may uh, oblige to file returns are POPIs, for instance. POPIs are partially owned uh, 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 enterprises and uh, or entities. And uh, so when you look into a tax or into an IFRS group, IFRS is uh, for, for German companies uh, uh, most common uh, accounting standard, which uh, is, is a basis for, for uh, Pillar 2. And uh, uh, if, if you look into the group, th there could be uh, 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 some entities excluded. Uh, uh, some entities uh, uh, may be considered which are not uh, uh, preparing AFI, IFRS uh, um, uh, 
balance sheet, for, for, for instance, permanent establishments. Permanent establishments are part of, of the, uh, the legal entity, but when we are dealing with pillar two, we are obliged to uh, um, have the jurisdictional blending and to, to calculate the, the, the tax base, the globi tax base for every uh, single constituent entity and for every country. And constituent entity is, uh, uh, for, for instance, uh, uh, the, the, a permanent establishment and uh, um, other companies which might not be part of the consolidation due to uh, uh, immateriality are, are uh, uh, part of, of uh, constituent entities that there is a de minimis rule uh, where companies uh, or, or countries could be excluded with sales of 10 million euros or profits of uh, 1 million euro. But generally, all these companies uh, are not meeting this de minimis rules uh, are to be part of the uh, uh, tax group or the constituent entities. In, in a second step, uh, um, the, the global income for every single uh, constituent entity needs to be uh, uh, calculated and uh, uh, the, the starting point is uh, uh, accounting standard IFRS uh, uh, normally and then you have to uh, uh, detect some items you have to include other items uh, so you need to understand what's going on with uh, uh, the accounting standard for, for instance you, you uh, can or, or need to exclude some uh, uh, portfolio dividends uh, uh, you, you need to uh, uh, to, to exclude or, or, or recalculate some fines or, and other things uh, which are dealing uh, uh, with tax specialities. And in a second step, you need to calculate the current taxes uh, here as well. The taxes which are part of the IFRS accounting of the a reporting package for each uh, a single entity is is a starting point, and then you have to adjust uh, uh, those taxes for for taxes which are not qualified as covered tax. Uh, you have to recast the deferred taxes with 15%. You have to exclude taxes which are not uh, paid in a, a certain time, for instance, five years. And th then when you have uh, uh, calculated the, the global income and the covered taxes, you can uh, go on with step four to calculate the effective tax rate. This effective tax rate has to be calculated for uh, uh, every single uh, country. So, so that means that you uh, uh, consolidate, not, not in a technical matter, but you uh, uh, summarize the, the uh, uh, global income and covered taxes of every constituent entity of a country. And then you can calculate the effective tax rate. If this tax rate is below 15%, the headquarter uh, uh, can levy or, or the country of the headquarter can levy uh, um, or, or must uh, levy an additional tax to uh, crown the minimum taxation of 15%. Um, the, the source countries, let me name it this way, are entitled to uh, uh, introduce a so-called qualified domestic top-up tax, which means that uh, countries with uh, low tax jurisdictions can uh, um, yeah, can tax uh, uh, these large multinationals in a way though that they can levy the taxes uh, in, in uh, the state of, of the constituent entity or not of the state of the headquarter. Then we have a, a um, calf out for, for substance, and we will show this later on in an example. And, and finally, uh, uh, you, you can calculate the IIR, the income inclusion rule, and uh, uh, can impose uh, taxes for uh, uh, the jurisdictions which are low taxed. And uh, um, the, the qualified domestic top up tax is uh, credited if it is not uh, um, granting a taxation of 15% in every uh, uh, jurisdiction. So I, I think this is a general rule. And uh, uh, the general rule is uh, not 
I've been told by officials of the German tax ministry not to uh, 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 grant additional taxes in, in Germany, but to grant a, a level playing field for, for taxation uh, uh, where it, it is not still possible to have uh, uh, low jurisdictions in a group to uh, uh, get tax, uh, um, get, to, to get low taxed income. And the, the next slides, I think, describe uh, the, the way it works uh, uh, very clearly. Here we have an example of a German AG, which is a UPE. UPE means ultimate parent entity. Germany uh, very probably is going to implement by uh, uh, 2024 the income inclusion rule. And uh, in, in Germany, the corporate income tax is 30%. Uh, um, the, the conclusion that uh, Germany is in any way high tax is, is uh, wrong. Our experience with uh, uh, our, our projects with German clients is that especially with the recast of the deferred taxes, which especially uh, uh, means in, in loss situations uh, uh, could if a, a risk that even uh, uh, German companies are low taxed uh, uh, if certain uh, uh, additional aspects come along. But ho however, the, the, uh, um, what, what we like to, to present here with, with this example is uh, how it works in general. Uh, um, Germany is, is the ultimate parent entity applying the income inclusion rule. And here are two subsidiaries in the Philippines. Um, the IFRS profit is 600 uh, for, for OPCO 1 and 300 for OPCO 2. The tax, uh, the covered taxes is uh, 30, uh, uh, respective 60, and the effective tax rate is 5% or, or, or 20%. Uh, the difference in the tax rate uh, um, has to do with the specialities of, of the global income calculation. So, so uh, even when the tax rate for both uh, companies is uh, nominal is the same, that the uh, uh, calculation uh, uh, models may uh, uh, give the result that uh, uh, the effective tax rate is, is different. And now, now we have to calculate the jurisdictional blending for, for the Philippines. The covered taxes here is uh, uh, 90 and uh, uh, the global income is 900. So it's a very easy calculation. The effective tax rate is 10. Uh, for, for the second company, it's uh, 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 or, or for the second uh, uh, step, it, it, the global minimum tax rate is, is 15 percent, of course. It's uh, 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 set by law. The effective tax rate here is, is 10 percent. So the top up tax, which is levied in Germany, is uh, 5 percent on the uh, uh, global income in the Philippines, which is uh, finally 45 top up tax. So this is the way it works. You have to do uh, uh, this calculation for every single uh, uh, country and uh, uh, th then calculate the, the final top up tax for, for the German uh, uh, mother company for the ultimate parent entity. So le let's go to the next example, please, to the next page. So here is uh, um, the, the example with a substance-based income carve out. And uh, uh, so th this rule says when in a country uh, are substantial, substantial assets or substantial payroll costs, you can get an carve out uh, of the for, for, for uh, the, these uh, um, aspects and uh, the law says it's 10% of the payroll costs in a special year and 8% of tangible assets. So here's the substance based income carve out or exclusion is, is 220. And uh, th then we do the same calculation like before, uh, but, but the 220 are excluded. And uh, th this, this rule 
enables uh, uh, low tax jurisdictions to uh, uh, let, let me say to to uh, get not uh, fully targeted but by the income inclusion rule or by pillar two uh, uh, when there is substance in in this country and uh, um, yeah that that's how it works and now we can look at the timeline what's going on in the european union uh, um, the uh, Pillar 2 directive is uh, uh, still in a draft version and uh, um, the, the, let's have a look uh, on the new timeline. OECD common territory on Pillar 2 has uh, been disclosed. Adoption of Pillar 2 EU directive October 2020, maybe. Uh, that the present status is that uh, uh, Poland, uh, uh, which uh, uh, initially didn't want to accept uh, uh, the rule has been convinced. However, Hungary uh, is, is not willing to accept the, the, the EU directive. And uh, uh, so, so um, all member states of the EU need to, to uh, um, accept the rule. If, if not, it uh, cannot uh, um, be accepted as a EU directive. And so it's still unclear what's going on and uh, whether or not that the single member states, uh, um, if, if, if uh, this exception is not uh, granted, if the member states uh, implement a law by themselves. Some countries, for, for instance, Belgium, uh, have uh, disclosed such uh, thoughts, but uh, the EU Commission asked the member states not to uh, dis disclose uh, uh, a un, uh, uh, yeah, uh, uh, unwished scenario, and, and, and therefore it's it's uh, still open what's going on. The, the plan is to uh, uh, come to let it come into force uh, with uh, December 20, 2020, uh, 2023, so that's right. And uh, so the first actions in, in uh, reporting terms would have been taken in, or will be taken in April 24. And the filing um, deadline for Pillar 2 tax return would be 30 June 2060. So it's a long time uh, uh, to, to file or until you need or the, the companies need to file the returns. However, uh, the, the, uh, um, it, it's impossible to collect the figures after uh, um, the, the, the times are, are running. So you need to have it uh, uh, from a technical uh, uh, aspect. You need to have it introduced in uh, 2040 at the beginning of 2040 because otherwise it's uh, nearly impossible to collect all these figures and uh, the, the, the clients we are dealing with have a, a thousand or more subsidiaries and it's it's uh, uh, impossible to do this by hand you need to automate automate it and uh, to implement uh, uh, programs tools uh, and so on so, so let's have a look on the next slide. So here's the overview of uh, uh, what, what what are uh, uh, some of of the challenges. Um, Pillar two is is, is uh, um, a EU directive for European uh, um, groups, and uh, it's it's based on accounting standards uh, uh, that there's a big discrepancy be be between uh, tax and, and accounting. Uh, you, you need to understand both. You need to uh, uh, embed it into the tax reporting, into the uh, uh, normal tax reporting, and uh, uh, the, the local tax rules need to be understood. So, so there is uh, uh, much uh, um, that there are much rules to be considered, uh, and it's a, a very, very uh, um, yeah, difficult uh, uh, task to to calculate the top up tax properly. So let's go to the next slide. 
So here are the, the, the real challenges, uh, tax accounting and reporting. You, you need to consider all the pillar two implications in, in, in the reporting into uh, uh, the, the, the uh, SAP or whatever uh, uh, accounting system. Um, the, the target is to uh, um, file a tax return, which needs to be uh, calculated diligently and uh, uh, under consideration of all uh, compliance uh, um, aspects, you, you need to adjust or to, to uh, um, yeah, have a closer look on the tax planning and controlling because uh, um, many of the tax planning aspects are dealing with uh, uh, generating uh, uh, low tax income and this could be targeted by by uh, this pillar two uh, principles and for, for, for the, the the right part of the slide shows the challenges for the company to implement it to implement it uh, um, to, to get all people in, in involved the IT the the accounting the finance department and so on and uh, uh, the, the digital process needs to be designed it's uh, um, not an issue for tax specialists, it's an uh, issue for IT specialists and they need to understand uh, what is uh, uh, necessary uh, for, for the tax people to, to collect and how can it be granted to collect all the figures, all the, the features in a right way by time. And uh, so the, the, the most challenged thing is uh, how to adopt the IT systems, uh, the databases and data sources, data flu. Uh, this is not, not, not uh, my specialty, but uh, uh, this is what, what, what the main focus of a project finally is. And um, we, our, our uh, experience so far has been that about 60% of the data points are not available. In, in a way which is necessary. So you have to implement uh, uh, additional information requests in, in, in your processes. And uh, um, another experience of, of ours is that, that about 70% uh, of the fee budget is for IT uh, issues. So let, let, let's go on, I think. Uh, um, not many slides remain. Yeah, this is uh, uh, so, so. We we are through. Thank you for. That was the, the last slide, actually. <laughs> uh, thank you very much, uh, Daniel. Um, I would say pillar two is really very very broad. Uh, the income inclusion rule is also really very broad and very complex technically, and uh, you could uh, briefly and brilliantly highlight the main features uh, of it. Uh, so before we move forward, I would like to remind the audience that uh, we will have a, a Q&A session at the end of uh, the presentations. So please, if you have questions, please type them in uh, in the chat box and uh, our speakers will endeavor to uh, answer as many questions as possible after the end of the presentations. So uh, let's move forward. Uh, Leonard, um, you will discuss the political aspects of all this with all ears. Please go ahead. All right. So, I mean, if we take a very big step back on why, why we have pillar one and pillar two anyway, we would have to go back in time probably more than 10 years uh, when we first saw the rise of US tech companies taking over the world. And what they would typically do is they would take structures, as you see on the slide here, uh, which you would have a US tech headquarter tech company. They would set up an offshore company. All their non-US IP would get transferred to the offshore company. Then they set up some sort of tax friendly intermediate hub in, in countries like Ireland, Netherlands or Luxembourg. Um, and the IP, they would make various charges to the Hubco, and the Hubco would just charge customers directly everywhere in the world. Now, this was considered problematic for a lot of uh, countries because you would have um, tech companies earning significant revenues in all these markets and having no taxable presence at all. And we're really talking about the biggest tech companies here. We're talking Facebook, Amazon, 
uh, Netflix, Google. So, I mean, they they call the fangs in, by their abbreviation, uh, but also smaller players would would do that. So they wouldn't make massive amount of margin margins on that, massive amount of of money on that, uh, without paying any local tax. Now, under the existing tax system, that is actually the correct outcome because there is no staff in all of these customer markets and there's no uh, functions, assets or risk in all these markets and all the income should under transfer pricing and PE rules be allocated to the hubco and then from there onwards to either the offshore company or the US techco. So there's obviously a lot of advisor work that went into these kind of structures and this is how, how, they, um, how they worked out and they worked very efficiently to be honest. Uh, for and worked very well for the tech companies, and they were able to achieve very low effective tax rates as well. Uh, part of that has to do with the U.S. tax system as well, but that's kind of the outcome that they had. It was one of the key drivers why we had PEPs in the first place. This structure and lots of other structures. Uh, but today we're ma mainly talking about these type of structures. Now, after BEPs, this structure didn't really work quite as well. There were like hybrid rules. There were an ATAT came into force in Europe that that disallows it in a lot of cases. The transfer pricing rules required a lot more asset and functions for IP to be held somewhere. So if we move to the next slide, all these tech companies just restructured into you know, something yeah. else. Uh, sorry to interrupt you, your camera flipped before we move to the next slide, if you can. Uh, you're upside, upside down, my friend. Right. <laughs> oh, um, I'm just yes. going okay, to go. do it like this. OK, okay. so. If we go to the next slide, we show what the companies did after BEPS got into force. They just moved the IP to the Hopco. And um, initially, there were thoughts of doing that through some sort of hybrid transfer or hybrid thing. But a lot of times, they just moved it fully onshore, let it manage by a bunch of staff. They get a step up in value on the IP, which is usually quite large, and they get amortization over that, which still reduces their tax, tax payables very, very low. Um, so, that in in a way, they continue life as normal. There were some accounting impacts of that that sh also allowed them to show a higher ETR without substantially increasing the amount of tax they pay paid in cash terms. Um, obviously, this creates problems down the line when the amortizations run out. But that's so far in the future that that tech companies weren't typically too bothered by it. Um, if we go also over what BEPS actually did in action item one, there, which was the digital economy, it was item one for a reason, because it was on top of the agenda of a lot of countries. They discussed these structures at length and with a lot of brutal honesty, and ultimately they concluded they weren't going to do anything about it. And the main reason was it because action item one was controlled by France and the US. France was very much in favor of, of getting sourced uh, country taxation in. And US was understandably very much opposed, so they couldn't see eye to eye to this at all. So everything was stuck in, uh, in, in gridlock. It all got kicked down the road and uh, people just ignored it. There were a lot of other action items to look at, so, so people didn't, weren't too bothered by it. But then a few things started happening. Yeah, so this is oh, actually, before we move on, this is a tech company structure. Obviously, a lot of other businesses that are not too tech driven can do a lot of similar things, and especially with the, the tech companies becoming less and less a distinct category, and a lot of normal businesses can sort of replicate this structure and do remote selling as well. And any IP driven structure could do something similar. Now, quite recently, there's been a lot of focus on US pharma, and let's move to the next slide. What they do is they take, take it to the next level in a way. They do a hubco with all the IP, I, I see the site still said non-USP, but they do all the IP in there. There's not really any staff in there, which under, under a non-US tax system wouldn't really work, but the US apparently is fine with this in a certain way. And they have a hub code. They do everything from the hub code and they sell everything back into the US. So this is actually farmers that are predominantly US are able to lower their effective tax rate by just offshoring their IP. So a lot of very aggressive structures are are possible, and they they sort of um, they they triggered a lot of this tax reform uh, need. So if we go now to the next slide, where we see like what did all of this trigger? Uh, this triggered. So we saw, of course, the remote selling structure and all the BEPS technique triggered the back action plan. 
after that didn't get solved, a lot of countries started looking for alternatives. The UK was the first one to introduce a digital service tax, at least as draft legislation, um, where they, they said, OK, we really want to solve this. We want to solve this on a very structural level by getting a source country allocation for at least certain business models. But we can't because the tax treaties don't allow us to do it. What can we do and in the end? And what can we do uh, in the context of the EU? Because at the time Brexit hadn't happened yet. And they finally came up with this digital service tax, which is in a way almost like an indirect tax because it's a gross tax on revenue. It's economically highly inefficient. No one is happy with this tax, not even the UK, not even all the, the France and all the countries that are proposed. Everyone is supremely unhappy with digital service tax, but they feel that this is something they need to do to get the ball moving. And they did get the ball moving because it caused trade wars almost, and in the end, it caused pillar one and pillar two. Um, in separately, the UN was working on a separate proposal, which is Article 12B, which was already touched on. Um, it's kind of like sort of a, almost like a sideshow in, in a way at the moment, but it could totally resurrect if, if everything fails, but more on that later. The other thing that really happened was the Trump tax cuts, TCGA, in 2017, um, which really changed the US tax system profoundly. I've heard it said like that the US in some ways is always behind the curve on taxes, in some way they're ahead of the curve on taxes. Two of the things they did was introduce guilty and beat, and guilty and beat have kind of become the, the template or the starting point for designing pillar two on, on how, how this works. Guilty is an, an global tax on all overseas income if the tax rate is too low. It's sort of an extreme version of CFC, but it groups all countries together. And if that income is below 10.5%, it gets taxed in the US. Beat the nice deduction of payments if the, the recipient is not effectively taxed on, the, on that um, under certain circumstances. Obviously, I'm very much simplifying in, in for the sake of time. So all of that led to the two pillar solution. Now. Pillar one is specifically targeted on these structures. Pillar two has obviously impact on these structures. The reason pillar two came into being was mainly because of Germany. France was very aggressively pushing for all of this. Um, Germany wasn't too on board with this because the US was already starting to change the bounds of the discussion. They said like, well, if we only do it on tech companies. That's going to hurt us a lot. Let's bring a lot of other stuff in scope. Let's go after German car makers. Let's go after Italian luxury luxury brands. Let's go after everything uh, that's that does like remote selling, just so that we can also get a bit out of pillar two, um, uh, out of pillar one. And Germany w was obviously not too happy about it, and they said, "Well, why don't we do a mi global minimum tax?" They, Germany has been wanting that for ages. N nobody really wanted it for the longest time, um, but all of a sudden everyone came together and said, Look, let's do this. Now, this is a sort of simplified way of looking at the political support because the political support for pillar one and pillar two is not even across the board. Um, obviously, France is very much in favor of pillar one. They also accept pillar two. European Commission is very much in favor in, on, for both because it fits into a lot of their other tax objectives, including the BFIT agenda. And Germany is very much in favor of pillar two. You'll see a lot of countries in the upper right quadrant. They are the ones driving all this and pushing all of this forward. The US administration, I mean, like Trump administration was very much opposed to all of this. The US administration came through and they kind of saw a way to make it all work also for them and make it fit in the US tax system. But that doesn't mean that they're very enthusiastic supporters. Um, countries like India and China needed a lot of convincing small open economies. Anyone that's sort of in the middle is kind of like got to the point where they're no longer actively opposing it, but it's not, they're not essentially loving the whole proposal or trying to move it along. Now, a lot has been made about countries of like Poland and Hungary and to a lesser extent as Estonia. They could be hit quite a bit by pillar two because in case of Poland, there's special regimes. Hungary has a tax rate below 15%. The main reason they signed up is because of pillar one, because they don't they, they do believe in pillar one. And a lot of the reason that they are opposing now the pillar two directive is because pillar one is stalling. Um, so more on that later. The main reason for including Czechia is because the pre 
EU, EU presidency move from France to Czechia. Bruno Le Maire, finance minister, had been pushing very hard for a lot of these changes. He failed in the end. Now it's Czech's turn, and um, they are they're more close, closely aligned to to where the, the Europe as a whole is. So in a way, they might be better positioned to facilitate a breakthrough. But we'll have to see what happens. All right, next slide. Let's talk about where we go from here. And what are the uh, uh, troubles? Oh, the animations have gone. So, um, so uh, first of all, um, the the pillar one and pillar two uh, directive are the EU implementation of the pillar pillar one and pillar two. Pillar one will fo follow next year because the rules aren't ready. Pillar two, obviously, is has been stalling. The US, after the deal got announced, tried to implement at least pillar two portion of it uh, through the Build Back Better Act, which came into being last year and it failed to pass and it failed, failed to get the votes. And uh, especially at least Senator Manchin from West Virginia, he kind of held the deciding vote and he wasn't playing playing ball. And he didn't actually object initially to the changes in the, in the BBBA, but now with inflation rising, he did. What the Build Better Act was going to do is it was going to change guilty into a country by country model where the ETR is calculated on every country specifically, and it would change the beat into a true U to PR, which would make the US not quite pillar two compliant, but close enough so that the rest of the world could pretend that their regimes are pillar two compliant, which would be a good outcome for the US, because it means that all the US multinational could just tick the box and say, all right, we are pillar two compliant. You don't have to worry about doing UTPR on us. Uh, you, you only have to think about whether you want to do a domestic top up tax on us, but ultimately pillar two tax will be collected. Even though the calculation mechanisms are different and a lot of things are different about it, we would all pretend as if it was okay. The third element of the BBA was the corporate alternative minimum tax, which I think a lot of non-US people didn't pay any attention to. It was kind of, almost redundant in the BBBA because it was a top up tax at 15% after guilty, the new guilty, all overseas profit would already be taxed at 15%. So it could only apply in certain US situations. But what's happened now is guilty reform is not happening, UTPR is not happening. So all we're left with is the co corporate alternative minimum tax, which is a 15% tax on book profits with certain adjustments. And because guilty is only at 10.5% and it has some exclusions, the 15% tax could actually bite in an overseas context. It is actually, the it's obviously a big win for the Biden administration politically, but for pillar two, this is very bad news. The, um, um, one second, the, for pillar two, this is very bad news. The, the thing that happens is that it becomes it, it now that there is an, a minimum tax in place, which is a minimum tax, but is nothing like pillar two in its design. It will be very difficult to convince um, modern lawmakers to say they also need the pillar two changes. That's problem one. Problem two is the US tax reform is not, they only do that every few years. Democrats are likely to lose majority. Republicans are very much against all of this. So pillar two is probably not gonna get implemented in the US. That's not fatal for pillar two because the EU could move on their own. Pillar one always had a difficult path in the US. It's going to get even more difficult. The Ministry of Finance in the US now has been um, forced by the Senate to do a real proper calculation of how much it would cost US. That's going to upset a lot of people. And it's all going to basically, the, the, the US is not going to implement Pillar one at least until 2025. And by that time, the whole world will have changed. Now, given Pillar one is not going to get implemented, by the US, you have the multilateral convention, which requires critical mass for it to become effective, which got them include the US, given at the size of the US, which means pillar one, if we follow the OECD project timeline, is simply not happening. It's not going to happen in the way that the OECD is suggesting. It might not happen at all. So it could all very much fall, fall apart, which is why in the upper right quadrant you see like something else is going to happen. Countries are not going to sit still and say, okay, we return to the way things were they're going to think of other ways. There was already some of that the European Commission told Hungary and Poland, we will look at other options if the U US doesn't implement. 
They've been very tight-lipped of what that means, but there's a lot of speculation that means a pillar one directive that would just override US treaties, which they can totally do legally from an EU law perspective. It is a very aggressive move, but it might actually happen. Um, so there might be unilateral pillar one, there might be digital service taxes, which is not economically significant in the grand scheme of things, but politically quite significant. And Article 12B UN model convention might make a comeback. We're just going to enter into very uncertain waters, given pillar one is likely to fall apart, at least in the way that the OECD envisage it. So I think that summarizes ev uh, everything. So. Thank you very much, Leonard. Yes, yes, it does actually, and we see how uh, political aspects of these two deals are, are 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 really complex. And with U.S. keeping changing its mind, its mind each time, it, it's adding uh, more complexity and it's adding more uncertainty. Um, so maybe pillar two or both the, the both pillar, pillars are losing momentum. We'll see. We'll see what what will happen in the few coming uh, weeks or, or months. Um, a reminder also about the Q and A session. So if you have any questions, please uh, type them in the chat chat box. Okay. Um, practical aspects, uh, Sunny. Uh, what do you have to tell us about the implementation challenges of CLOB and the potential impact of the OECD on developed and developing countries? Sunny, please, the floor is yours. Uh, all right, I was on mute. I didn't realize that. All right, so uh, thank you. Thank you, Manil. I will share my screen and uh, uh, maybe if you can stop sharing it, I will, I will share the screen. Is my screen visible? Yes, it is. Go ahead, please. All right. So, yeah, in the next 10 minutes, uh, I will be talking about two topics, implementation challenges of pillar two and a possible solution. And the second topic is how OECD has tried to theoretically achieve a balanced outcome for develop and developing countries. In the second topic, I have some data which would substantiate my opinion. But let's look at and start with the first topic. One of the most striking feature of the pillar two is a sheer volume of computational complexity it imposes on the taxpayer. Let us first understand what these computational complexities are and then talk about a possible solution for it. Under the pillar two, the first step to compute or to, uh, to identify uh, whether the globe rule is applicable or not, is to identify whether a jurisdiction is under tax. And to do that, you need to compute effective tax rate of a particular jurisdiction. And then compare that with the global minimum tax rate of 15%. If it is less than the 15%, ETR is less than the 15% minimum tax rate, then that jurisdiction would be under tax jurisdiction. Now, OECD under Pillar 2 has prescribed a method or a mechanism for computing a jurisdiction and effective tax. The formula for which is adjusted covered taxes on a jurisdiction basis to globe income or globe income. While this formula looks quite straightforward, but it requires more than 30 adjustments, some of it are like tax to uh, book to tax adjustments, like timing differences. And some are some adjustments specifically designed to factor or exclude like shipping income from the globe, globe income. So almost like more than 30 adjustments to be made to numerator and denominator in the formula taken together. This is going to be quite mammoth exercise. Consider a situation where a multinational group has 50 subsidiaries across 50 jurisdictions. In that case, a multinational would have to compute or identify 1,500 data points, which is 30 adjustment points into 50 jurisdictions to compute and determine the first step whether a particular jurisdiction is under tax. This is going to be quite burdensome administrative burden for the multinational. So what's the solution for this? A simplified approach is 
something which could ease the administrative burden of the taxpayer and tax administration. One of the simplification measure is a country by country ETR safe harbor. This was discussed by OECD in the pillar two blueprint, which was released in October 2020. Before we get into what this CVCR ETR safe harbor is, let me just quickly talk about what CVCR means for the benefit of everyone in the audience. Under CVCR, large multinationals having turnover consolidated revenue of 750 million euro are required to file annually country by country reporting. It's also called a CVCR in the short term. This CVCR filing has certain financial data points. Out of all these financial data points that are reported in CBCR, two data points are quite relevant. First is the income tax accrued in the current year, and the second is profit or a loss before taxes. With these two data points, a simplified jurisdictional PPR can be computed by leveraging on the data which is existing and available with the taxpayer. Under the CBCR PPR safe harbor, if a jurisdiction's effective tax rate, the simplified tax rate, uh, EPR computed using the uh, CBC data, is above a certain threshold, then no further work would be required for that jurisdiction under the pillar to no way. So right now, um, uh, before going into this, like this safe harbor rule is still a work in progress. It is expected to be by, released by end of this year. And being a safe harbor, naturally, the threshold would be higher than the minimum global tax rate of 15%. Right now, we do not know what exactly that would be, but it would be any time higher than what is there in the global tax. So let's take an example where OECD comes up with a safe harbor of 20% threshold, EPR threshold, using CBCR. It means that all the jurisdictions where the multinational has its presence, and if that jurisdiction has an effective BPA, effective tax rate using the simplified formula which OECD would describe using the CBCR data, if it is about twenty percent, then no further work would be required for that jurisdiction. So, in our example, if the fifty jurisdictions out of that, if thirty jurisdictions have ETR simplified ETR of more than twenty percent, then those thirty jurisdictions are outside the scope of this would ease the administrative burden of the taxpayer significantly and also would reduce the administrative burden of the tax authorities. So CBCR safe harbor is quite a pragmatic solution, but how do you compute this using a CBCR data? While the CBCR data is there, most of the multinationals prepare it in Excel, uh, and Excel could be quite handy tool to compute this simplified ETR, but there are certain tools available in the market. You can use certain tools for computing your filing of CBCR, doing analytics, and also identifying the effective tax rate for each jurisdiction. Like at Iberia, we have developed a technology which helps multinational file CBCR, undertake analytics, and also compute the ETR across all jurisdictions. Let me just show it to you how it looks like. But uh, this is like a quite a simplified version of it. Um, so, yeah, should appear in a minute. Okay, while it's uploading, uh, the point that I wanted to make over here is there is a need for the simplified approach. And CBCR data could be a very handy information because it's already available with the taxpayer. And most of the taxpayers who would be doing a CBCR would be covered under the globe rule as well because the threshold of 750 million is common across the CBCR filing requirement and also in the globe rule under pillar. So this could be a quite pragmatic solution which OECD should further consider and develop a safe harbor related case. This was the first part of the topic that I wanted to discuss. In my second session or, or in the second topic, I will be discussing about 
how OECD has tried to achieve a balanced outcome or a harmonized out outcome for developed and developing countries. For this, I have taken some data which I will be presenting to you shortly. When you look at the overall design of Pillar 2, there are two parts to it. There's a global and then there is subject to tax rule, STPI. Let us first talk about the globe. globe. When you look at this rule, particularly the income inclusion rule under the global rule, it is designed to benefit the jurisdiction where the ultimate parent entity of the multinational group is located. And most of the large multinationals, which have uh, which cross the 750 million threshold, have the parent entity in developed economies. Let me substantiate this point with some data. There are around 6,263 multinational groups that could be covered under the scope of global. This data is extracted from BBD database by applying the 750 million threshold. Now, what I have did, I have split this entities or 6,263 6, multinationals and bucketed them under three baskets. Developed economies, almost 65% of the parent entities of these 6,000 odd entities are in developed economies. 21% is in China, which is somewhere in de between developed and developing economies. And only 14% is in developing. So this data, with this data, we can understand that there's not much upside of the pillar to globe rule for developing economies. It's only like at a macro level, 14% of the developing economies have parent entity. At the same time, there is a much downside of the globe rule to pillar, uh, pillar to globe rule doesn't have much downside for the developing economies. I will talk about this with some another set of data points. Before I discuss this data point, let me talk about what this data is. This is the statutory tax rate across developing economies. And most of the developing economies have a very high statutory tax rate, corporate tax rate. Now, out of 137 member firms, like member uh, countries, OECD, G20, and inclusive uh, framework member countries, statutory tax rate data for 128 member countries was available. Out of those 120 member countries, 66 qualify as a developing economy as per the OECD's definition of developed and developing economy. Of this 66, almost 32 have tax rate above 30%. Another 32% developing economies have tax rate between 25 to 30%. And 18% have tax rate between 20 to 25%. When I'm referring over here to the statutory tax rate, it's not an effective tax rate, nor I have taken into consideration any specific tax exemption or a concessional tax rate that are operational in certain jurisdictions. So at a macro level, when you look out of these 66 jurisdictions, almost 82% have tax rate above 20%. Well, this cannot be a conclusion that uh, uh, the effective tax rate will be more than 15%, but at least some inference could be drawn by analyzing these two data points that at least it could be safe assumption to say that the effective tax rate with such a high statutory tax rates could be equal to or more than 15%. That's an inference that is being drawn. It's not a conclusion by them. So with this, there isn't much downside of it as the tax rates in the developing economies is already high. So they would rarely come into a situation where they would have to shift their taxing rights to develop the economy. At the same time, there is always this domestic minimum, qualified domestic minimum top of tax mechanism available to be implemented in these jurisdictions to prevent shifting of the tax. So to sum up, when it comes to the globe rule, 
there is not much downside, nor there is upside. It's quite a neutral outcome for a developing economy. At the same time, there is the second part of the pillar two, which is subject to tax bill. And STPR empowers the sourcing jurisdiction to charge a minimum tax rate of 9% on certain categories of related parties, like royalty, interest on loan or finances, and there are other risks of such payments. So when you look at uh, how the developed and de developing economies are structured, most of the developing economies are subsidiary jurisdiction, which imports the technology and pays out royalty. They get the loan finance from the group company and pay out interest. So with this subject to tax rule, developing economies can impose a minimum effect, a minimum tax rate of 9% on these payments made to the related entity. So this is something of a value for developing economies. So overall, to sum up the entire analysis, while the globe E rule would not would be would have like a neutral outcome for developing economies, but the subject to tax rule is something which could be of a value to a developing economy. Here, I would want to make a point of a caution, like globe uh, globe rule or pillar two would have certain implications which are beyond taxes. For instance, uh, impact on the foreign direct investment for the developing economy. And this is something which is not known yet. But one can, at least from a tax point of view and in theory, by looking at these two data points, one can safely, or I would say, draw some inference to, con to a conclusion that low rule may have a neutral outcome. SDPR would be beneficial. And hence, there is a harmonized outcome for both developed and developed. But this is theory. In practice, how it turns out to be, no one knows. We need to wait and see how the outcome looks like when we actually implement it. So this is what I wanted to come, uh, like, have it discussed in this session. Happy to address any questions that you have. And uh, over to you, Manish. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Sunny. Finally, we started having some some figures uh, about the potential impact of, of this deal on developed and developing countries. I don't know whether it will be balanced uh, at the end. Uh, I mean, STTR, um, I mean, developing countries will have some uh, difficulties applying STTR. You know, it depends on identifying whether the payment is a BEPS payment or not. So so we'll see. We'll see what, uh, what will happen. Uh, thank you uh, very much for, for these uh, uh, high quality presentations and this uh, great input. Uh, we got some questions uh, meanwhile. Uh, the most frequently asked question is, uh, I'm, I'm reading the questions uh, as they were um, uh, typed by our um, attendees, as they were asked, should developing nations implement their own DSTs now or better to wait for a global agreement. I think this uh, this question uh, is for Leonard, but of course, uh, Angie, Sunny, uh, Daniel, if you want to comment, of course, uh, we would love to. Please do. The, the, I think the key question is, what, what are you trying to achieve with implementing a, a DST? Because um, it's, it's an, a very economically distortive tax that was designed for a very specific purpose. Uh, for taxing digital businesses um, without bre breaching tax treaties and EU law. It is, um, it will undertax some businesses and it will overtax some businesses. Um, I think it also risks drawing the eye of the US, but given the US is not, not going to implement, it's probably not going to have too much of an effect. Um, yeah, it is a source of revenue that there are probably economically more uh, better ways to do it. I mean, like if you were, if blank piece of paper, if you were able to, to, to implement 12B in all your tax treaties with a stroke of a pen, then, then that would probably be a, sort of a more efficient approach, but you won't be able to do that because you would need to change all your tax treaties. So I think given the uncertainty around this, it's probably better to wait a little bit to see how everything is going. 
but uh, the, for no one ever considered digital service tax to be an, a final outcome for this. So I don't think it, it will be a very long-term solution. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you, Leonard. I completely agree with you. Uh, the second question, actually, we're not receiving uh, technical questions. Uh, I'm, I'm quite uh, surprised with this. We're receiving uh, questions uh, about the political aspects uh, of what we discussed. So uh, I'm reading the question. Uh, considering the resistance of US Senate and uh, the resistance from Hungary, do you think that Pillar 2 is losing momentum and is likely to be implemented by G7 countries only. It's it is losing momentum. There's no doubt about it. But it's still possible to, that some of it will get over the line. G7. I mean, G7 includes the US, and the US is not going to implement it for a few few years to come. Is my, my assessment of the situation. So so I think um, it might very well like the, there might very well be an EU agreement in October. It might be that Hungary continues to object, but the EU. Can, can move on without Hungary. There's enhanced cooperation, there's unilateral implementation of Pillar 2. And if you have 26 EU countries implementing Pillar 2, that's a pretty big block. And the way Pillar 2 works is that if enough critical mass, uh, if large countries implement Pillar 2 and include the UTPR, then that is like, and with large countries, I mean countries that multinationals can't do without, that means that all multinationals that can't do without those countries will pay the top up tax in full somewhere. So then that creates an incentive for everybody else to implement the top up tax because it's, it doesn't increase the marginal tax uh, payments by the businesses. So Pillar 2 still has a very good chance to being eventually almost globally adopted. Um, so we'll have to wait, but I think that for Pillar 2, the chances are looking okay-ish, not as good as a few months ago, but they're still looking okay. It's for pillar one, it's a very different story. Okay, agree. And, and this answers actually, I think, the third question. Uh, it's a statement followed by a question. Uh, pillar two is likely to be implemented in EU as Czech Republic is pushing to vote the EU directive. We also saw that UK published uh, draft rules to implement Globe in its domestic legislation. Would a partial implementation be likely to happen? Uh, knowing that this will lead to double taxation, would this push uh, US MEs to lobby and push the Congress to vote the law aligning guilty with Globe? What will happen then with CAMT? I think CMA, CIMT is, is probably going to stay either way. Let's start with that uh, because CMT, the, the minimum tax will just become toothless if, if the, well, not toothless. It, it will, will a lot, guilty will take a lot of care of a lot of issues wh which result in, in CMT not, not uh, having an effective liability anymore. So um, it will just lose focus, but it will stay around. I think what will happen if there is critical mass, then the US is a bit of a crossroads. The Republicans will say, let's start a trade war, let's fight everyone. Democrats will say, let's change our tax laws. Um, but most likely there will be partisan gridlock. This, this has been debated at length between tax experts. And I think the most commonly held view is, um, it will be like a donkey who, can't, who is stuck between two roads and can't decide which way, and they will just stay in the middle and nothing will happen for a while. Um, because of the gridlock, um, which is a bad outcome. Now, it, it, there is a question, what is the, the corporate America going to do? Are they going to lobby for those changes? Right now, they've been very much opposed to any changes. Potentially, that will change a little bit, but um, it, it will require quite a bit of change uh, for that to happen. And the politics in the US is very difficult, so probably my assessment is the most likely outcome is it will just get stuck in gridlock in the US. Uh, Daniel, Angie, Sunny, want to add something? Well, I think that <clears throat> I can agree to what Lev says that um, I see also a lot of, if, if you look at the practice on how to deal with that uh, from, from a company perspective, you see a lot of companies, multinationals, Deciding on a wait and see approach, right? Because it can 
if if you open the newspapers or or, or looking at the uh, news items uh, in Google or something like that, you see also see the Irish being now opposed. Uh, uh, it, it can go either way, um, but I don't think that the discussion will will end uh, soon. I think that part of potentially what politicians aim for is is countries and companies already changing current practice in some kind of manner. Um, so a little bit of the, the nudging theory, so moving them away from the, the overly aggressive structures. So because if you if you if you ask me, I'm, I'm a consultant, if you ask me should I should I do this structure or, or that structure, um, knowing that pillar one, pillar two may happen, you already take that into account, right? Today, um, of, of of what might happen. So maybe that's also already uh, a part of of the answer. Um, that that for some politicians is, is sufficient. Uh, that that it nudged companies away from from certain type of of of, of structurings and investments. So in that sense, I think they already have achieved something. Uh, if that would be the target for them. 